welcome to On The Ledge podcast, episode 288. I am your host, Jane Perone. And if you've ever looked at your plant and just thought, I wish you could tell me what's wrong, then this is the podcast for you. In this week's show, I'm talking to Don Billington about all things Tillandsia. What are they? Where do they come from and how do you grow these fascinating air plants? And in an extended q and I'm discussing the pineapple plant. How do you get ananas to grow successfully in your home? And can you indeed get it to fruit? We shall see. Welcome back to On The Ledge. If you are a new listener then what is this all about? Well, it's my podcast where I talk about plants with cool planty people and help you understand plants better, specifically the ones that grow in your house. And in this week's episode, I am following up on something I've been doing for a while now, the RHS plant trials of air plants, aka Tillandsia. I am one of a group of people who have been asked by the RHS to assess a group of Tillandsia species and cultivars to see which ones deserve an RHS AGM Award of Garden Merit. So that involves going to Walton Hall in Warrington every so often to meet up with Don Billington of Every Picture Tells a Story, a bromeliad grower, and looking at the Tillandsias that he's been growing on the RHS's behalf to see which ones are thriving, which ones would make a good plant for the average grower. So when I went up last week, I caught up with Don and asked him to chat with me about Tillandsias to find out more about these fascinating bromeliads. And if you've never heard of the RHS plant trials, go back and listen to On The Ledge episode 272, where you can find out what they are all about. I'll put the link in the show notes just in case you want to go back and check that out. But now let's enjoy my chat with Don Billington about the wonders of air plants. Hi, I'm Don Billington, and at this moment in time, I'm actually chairing the RHS trials on Tillandsias at Walton Park in Warrington. We are here for these trials. It's very exciting to see lots of Tillandsias growing and getting a chance to compare and contrast this amazing genus of plants. But for those of us who maybe haven't grown Tillandsias before, what are they? Where do they grow in the wild? And why do they make such good plants? Well, Tillandsias are predominantly what we call air plants. Uh, and what I mean by that is they grow in the air, or another word for them is epiphyte, which basically just means plant on. Uh, the, the type that we grow quite a lot of here, the Eusenoides, everyone calls it Spanish moss, which I don't know why, because it's not Spanish and it's not a moss. <laughs> but people like to grow that one. has no root system at all. The uh, thing what's coming in with the Tillandsia as well are the good air plants. And what they do is they actually clean the air as well. So they, if you've got them at home, they will clean the air for you. Very easy to grow at home because they need minimum water, minimal water. Um, if you want to go for some of the bigger ones, you can. You can set them up in displays on bits of bark or even place them on a little bit of slate. Uh, I certainly don't use any glue to stick them onto stuff. We use like fish and twine and things like that. And if you leave them alone on the surface, they'll eventually stick themselves on. Now, I see these being sold, and I think sometimes people think that they can just stick them on the shelf and just never do anything with mm. them. They do need water. So how do you yeah. provide that water, and how do you tell when they need watering? Yeah. The, the thing with them is that we, we generally tell people when they when they first get them, if they start watering every, say, eight to ten days with a very, very fine spray, if you're really interested and look at your plants, the plant will start telling you when it needs watering. They do that themselves. In certain cases, they might just curl up. Or something like this, it's tip, uh, one plant called uh, Streptophila, another one called Curly Slim. The leaves curl a little bit tighter, so that means they're getting drier. 
OK, so that's your signal. It's time. So some people I've seen, some people soaking them in a basin of water. Is that a good idea or is it better just to do the misting? No, it, it is a good idea. But it's, it's, it's you knowing your plants. Some of them you can sort of put in for a minute or two, let them soak up and they're great. Take them out. Others might need that little bit longer to get the water into the leaves. And again, when you do do that, always turn the plants upside down and shake out the excess water that come into them. The way they actually work is a lot of the, well, all the tillandsias have scales called trichomes. And what the plant does, it takes in air, light and moisture and then converts that into a nutrient. And that's where it gets its feed from. Right, so they're not relying on, uh, as you say, they're not in soil, so they're not drawing nutrients up from the soil, mm. they're taking out of the air, which makes them a really fascinating group of plants. And where are these growing in the world? Where where might we be seeing these in the wild? Well, they were indigenous, indigenous to what we call the New World, so they, would start, they actually started off in the southern states of North America, down the central islands, uh, in the central, central America and into South America as well. And if somebody was getting into these plants, what are the kind of key species for beginners that you would recommend? Obviously, this is what we're trying to find out from the yeah. trial, but I'm asking for a preview, in your opinion, well, Don, which ones would you well, be what growing? We have, what we have now here with the trials, we've got 47 different uh, species or cultivars of Tillandsia. And what we're now trying to do is identify them. The reason there's only 47 is because that's the ones that are commercially available. So, I mean, we've got plants here, like the Zera Graphica now, which is protected by Cites, we're not going to be testing that uh, or trialing that because you can't get it now, you know, and you shouldn't be getting it because it's protected. Because it's endangered it's in its natural environment. It's an endangered species, yeah. And presumably, I'd imagine, is this a plant where we're seeing developments in tissue culture starting to happen because of the dangers of taking them out of the wild and plants being tissue cultured and grown from seed? Um, well, it's a difficult question now because it's more like a case of how if if they are doing that. I do know that there's mass production getting done in in Holland with certain plants. Um, some of the techniques I'm not really too sure of. I mean, we do ours by offsets or mm -hmm. by getting younger plants in and things like that. Now, are these plants where they they do flower? They do have um, these flowers that vary in in size and drama. Um, are they one of these plants where the f plant flowers and then it dies? Yeah, they're, they're all monocarpic. Yeah. So basically what monocarpic basically just means it only flowers the once. Once they start to flower, then that's when you'll see the offsets or pups coming from the sides and they'll sort of grow on. We have a, a, a guide, a guideline of don't take the pups off or the offsets off until it's at least one third the size of the parent. But when you are dealing with tillandsias, there are little techniques in taking them off. You just wouldn't pop them out. In some cases, you take the lower leaves off where the pups are and sort of tease it away from the side. So you wouldn't want to sort of take away the, the, the metastem part of it. Yeah, got you. And this is the, the little tips that you need to know how to succeed with these plants. Lightwise, when, are we putting these with our cacti and succulents in the sunniest spot or are we just drawing them away just a little bit? You know what, they like good sun. The problem with growing these in the UK is you're going to be growing them indoors. So if you put it by a window... The magnifying effect of the sun through the glass is not good for them. I mentioned Zeregrafe before. That lives in full sun in, in Guatemala and places like that. In the UK, you will need to protect them from the sun. So they like good light, but not direct. Yeah. And are there, uh, can you tell just by looking at a plant how much sun it's adapted to? Is it the hairier ones that might be a little bit well, more sun tolerant? Well, do you know, now, there's just been sort of like more work done on them. And they actually sort of now, uh, they are suggesting, and I don't disagree with this, that the actual scales on the plants now are also used to deflect the sun. Mm -hmm. But in its natural habitat, certainly with the, um, in, in the UK, the, with the sun through the glass, it's not going to do it that much and mm -hmm. will scorch mm -hmm. them and will dry them out it's like when i said earlier on about when you watered it if you over water the chances of bringing one back are really slim if it's if it's underwater and very very dry you can always sort of like either spray it or yeah. dunk it and try to revive it again so it sounds like a plant that you can display in lots of really interesting ways and i guess this is probably the key trying to do something that looks interesting. Yeah. How how do you like to see these plants displayed? Well, we like we like, if you'd ever visit Walton Hall Park in Warrington, if you come oh, into right. the, the main atrium, you'd see the display that we have. We have a very big uh, display opposite to the side of the trials of how they sort of live, and we tie them on branches. We sort of get them up in the, the air. The more so Zerich ones, I mean drought loving ones, go higher because yeah. I know they're not going to need as much water.
Yeah, and this is a joy, I guess, for people who um, sometimes people don't want to have big clumps of soil in their home. This is a good plant to choose because Absolutely. you don't need any soil for them to grow. No, well, if you put it in soil, it's going to rot. Right, and presumably, do you need? I mean, I've, I think I've seen special sprays that you can buy. Do, is that is that not worth the money, or is it? Is, are they a good investment if you've got a lot of tillandsias? Well, what we're actually doing now as part of the trial is there are a couple of items on the market that we're going to trial mm. alongside the uh, the actual plant trial itself and we've got two two pieces of bark with the same amount of plants on and the same type of plants and we're going to use two dip, different types of feeds we've i personally been growing these for many many years but we've been based here now for three or four years and in all that time we haven't fed one plant so the ones that are on display have not been fed but we will be trialing uh, a couple of feeds that are on the market and then hopefully by the end of the trials that we're doing that will be part of the report that we're doing. Oh, that's brilliant. And it's lovely to see these plants growing in abundance. I think these are plants really that you have to grow quite a lot of to really kind of get a good display. If you've just got one lonely little plant, sometimes it doesn't have the same impact. No, it does. A lot of the stuff what we grow here is in clumps. Uh, obviously, some of the really bigger plants that we've got are single ones. But yeah, I mean, if you think about it, like some of them are smaller than a tangerine. And some of the same plants that we've got here when they clump up are the size of a football they're really good when they do clump up. Yeah, and any with good scents? Do we get any f yeah. scented flowers? Oh, gosh, yeah, yeah. There's quite a few that have a, have scents. Um, probably not going to give you the list of them now because no one can ever remember. Like, <laughs> But we, we, we're actually trialling plants that are specifically with scents. And what's your absolute favourite, Tillandsia? Have you got an absolute fave oh, that you... Gosh, no. I know, it's like it, a favourite child, I know, yeah, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's one of them. It's the one that you're working with or if one comes into flower. I'm just trying to think now which one do I do, like... Uh, I like Xerographica because I know it gets really big and it doesn't take that much looking after because it can go very dry. Yeah, I mean, I, from the trial so far, I love the um, the Tectorum, which is the very, oh, very, very yeah. silvery plant. The te Tectorum is is actually terrestrial. It grows on rocks. It's not an, it, it is an air plant, but it doesn't grow on a branch or what have I yeah. see, okay. And that's, that's indigenous to the Andes in in Peru and Ecuador. And there are different forms of it. You know, uh, but it, that is a lovely one, that because it's one that gives you a great example of the trichomes and all the hairs Absolutely. on the leaves and stuff like that, yeah. The other one that's really catching my eye is the Milano Crata. Um, I think that's got beautiful colour with the maroon base to the leaves yeah. and those very stiff leaves, and it's now they're now flowering as well. Yeah. I think that's a good one. Although it's so interesting with the trials because everyone has a slightly different opinion. Yeah. You can see whether something's growing well, but everyone has a slightly different taste. Yeah, I mean, when we set, we, when the, the RHS asked me to sort of set up the trials, I kind of went to people you know, of a, you know, really who knew the plants anyway, uh, but from different opinions that come in from them. I mean, some commercial, some, you know, we got journalists, we got guys that are from Q and places like that. And the, the people on the committee all come from different angles and that all mix in, mixes in. And we will come up with a really good, a good outcome. I'm sure we will. And it'll be really interesting to see what makes that final cut and oh. gets awarded the AGM. And uh, listeners can go back and listen to my previous interview uh, about the plant trials to find out what these, how these plant trials work. It's, it's core work of the RHS, so it's great to be involved. Mm. And, um, and, and I think uh, Talanzi is on the upper. You're finding that more and more people are coming to them as, as plants for indoors? Yeah. Yeah, they are. They, they're getting more and more popular now. And, you know, the, the main thing what we do now, it's all about how to look after them. That's the information that we're giving out. So. Any other tips for, for care? We've talked about food. Just absolutely do not overwater them and absolutely do not put them in a pot or a terrarium. <laughs> You know, the, the, the actual Tillandsias need air, light and moisture to survive. You put it in a glass bottle, it's not getting the air. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, it's a bit tragic when you see those and you think, please take it out of the glass, <laughs> the globe. Well, yep. thank you so much, Don. And we'll be back here in a few months for, for the next round of, uh, of looking at the plants. But it's fascinating to, to hear uh, more about Tillandsia. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks so much to Don. And you may be wondering, well, which Tillandsias are 
going to be getting an AGM? Right now, I can't tell you because this process is a long one. It lasts three years. So over three years, these tillandsias will be grown and assessed. Uh, so it gives the plants a chance to really show their true colours and we can really see how they're performing. So obviously, there are some that are standing out as being better than others and every time we meet we vote on whether a plant should be moved a little bit closer to getting an AGM but it'll be a final assessment at the end of the trial that chooses those AGMs and then releases that information to the world via the Royal Horticultural Society. And the joy of having about a dozen people assessing these plants is that you've got everyone from people like me who love house plants but aren't Tillandsia specialists to specialist Tillandsia growers who really know their stuff. So it's a mixed bag of people doing the assessment and that adds to the accuracy because of course some plants are going to be ones that the real enthusiasts will love but maybe the general public won't get so excited about. I'll keep you up to date with what's going on with the AGMs, but if you want to go find out more, go and check out the show notes and I will put links in there to more information about other AGM trials that are going on at the moment and where you can find out more. Q&A coming up shortly, but first a soup song, possibly even just a crouton of housekeeping for you today. I am going to be at the Malvern Spring Show, which takes place uh, over, I think it's four days, the 9th to the 12th of May. So Malvern is in uh, the UK, in the county of Worcestershire, and I'm going to be at the Malvern Spring Show. I have to say I've never been before, so it's quite exciting, but it's extra exciting because they've got a whole new house plant area and there's going to be talks and all sorts at this special event organized by the lovely green rooms market and i'm going to be there on the saturday and the sunday that's the 11th and the 12th of may i'm going to be doing a talk recording a live podcast and also doing a houseplant Q&A with some other houseplant experts. It's going to be enormous amounts of fun. So if you are anywhere close to Malvern, then please do book yourself some tickets. I'll put links in the show notes to find out more about that. Cannot wait for that. And a nice response to the episode about fungus gnats, the resurfaced episode from my archive. I had a lovely email from Dutch listener Kuhn, who reminded me that in that episode, I didn't mention the other biological control for fungus gnats, which are called Stratiolelaps simitus. What a great name also often sold as hypoaspis mites. So these are predatory soil mites and they go around eating the eggs and the larvae of the fungus gnat. They also handily will control thrips and root mealybugs. And they're good if you've got just a small population of fungus gnats because they can survive quite a long time without eating anything. So they just kind of go into a sort of a semi hibernation state until food turns up and the other thing about hypoaspis mites is they're good for house plants that uh, don't want to be sopping wet all the time so things like cacti and succulents where for the nematodes you have to keep the soil really moist right because in order for those nematodes to move through the soil they use water so so you need the soil to be moist you know not sopping wet but definitely moist for the fungus gnat larvae to be eaten by the nematodes hypoaspis mites are good for soil that cannot be allowed to be kept that dry and so you may be saying well you know fungus gnats only like really moist soil well not true they can live perfectly well in drier soil they just don't proliferate quite as much so if you've got fungus gnats in a cactus and succulent collection these are definitely worth a look and they're a little bit easier to apply than the nematodes because rather than having to do a very careful dilution in water and lots of stirring and watering on these just come in a little bit of substrate and you can just scatter that on the surface of the soil and the hypoaspis mites go to work. They are probably not going to completely destroy uh, the whole of your fungus snap problem, but they will keep it under control. And as I say, have that bonus of controlling thrips and the dreaded, well, dreaded by me anyway, root mealybug. So thank you to Coon for pointing that out. And 
please do get in touch when you notice things in the episode that I've forgotten because I'm only human and it's great to have your input. Uh, so yeah, do keep uh, keep them coming, as it were. And thank you very much to Kuhn for getting in touch. Um, Kuhn also said that uh, in professional horticulture, in where he works, he's a Dutch, obviously, the huge industry there of professional horticulture, finding that thrips is on the rise in tropical houseplants in, on the professional scene and asking if I've seen that mirrored among hobby growers. And I would say definitely yes. I'm sure you can tell me whether you agree, but I think thrips are on the rise. I think it's a combination of two things. One, that people are growing the kind of plants that thrips love more. So things like aroids that they really do find particularly tasty. People are growing those in greater and greater numbers. So thrips are turning up. Whether that means the overall thrip population, mustn't say thrip, if you remember my thrips episode, you can't say thrip. The singular and the plural are both thrips. So thrips are definitely uh, on the rise. Whether the overall population is growing or whether we're just seeing them on plants, I don't know. But I'd love to know what you're finding with thrips in your houseplant collections. I have to say touch wood. I'm touching my head now because, you know, wooden head. <laughs> I think that I've mainly avoided thrips. I've had them a couple of times, but they haven't been too much of a problem. Why am I saying that? It, I'm just bound to have the world's worst infestation of thrips now, but oh well, we shall see. Anyway, there you go. Hyperasmus mites, definitely worth a try if you have fungus gnats and uh, maybe the nematodes aren't right for you. As previously billed, it's now time for the Q&A. Now this turned into a bit of a bumper one because there was so much to say. But let's start with the question. It comes from Emma and concerns a pineapple plant that Emma was given by a friend and she's desperate to save it. The leaves are starting to go brown and Emma doesn't know what to do. Now, pineapples, I think, are becoming increasingly popular as houseplants. I keep seeing them on sale in garden centres and other places that sell plants. But I want to address, do they make good houseplants? And how can you grow one? And also a hack for getting a free pineapple. So let's start with Emma's plant, Ananas camosus is the pineapple that we see in our supermarkets and this is often also the pineapple that we see for sale as a houseplant. Like the air plants, the Tillandsia, this is a member of the bromeliad family. But if you've ever seen pictures of pineapple farms, you'll know that these are not grown as epiphytes like the Tillandsia. So they're not grown in trees. They are grown usually as massive monocultures, actually, uh, in places like Costa Rica, which I think has about almost half the world's pineapple production. So it's a terrestrial plant, but it's like it is now because it has been cultivated and moulded by humans over thousands of years. Going back to the indigenous peoples of South America, this is a, a the wild origins of this plant are in South America, um, but it's so far back and it's been so changed over history that we don't really quite know what the original looked like. The current pineapple we enjoy, well, the spiny leaves have been kind of made smooth. The fruit is obviously much more fleshy than it would have been originally. And it's usually seedless because it has been bred that way and the plant is reproduced via offsets, uh, via the little baby plants that come off the, the bottom of the rosette when the plant has flowered and fruited because this is a monocarpic plant. So a plant that after it's flowered and fruited will die. But like the agaves and various other plant groups, it will easily produce these offsets which can then make, go on and make new plants so that's the first thing that emma needs to know it could be just be that her pineapple has flowered and fruited and is getting towards the end of its life and may very very slowly start to decline and reach the end of its life 
I suspect, though, that Emma might currently be hastening its decline by giving it too much water. In fact, she says as much in her message that she thinks she's giving it too much water, bearing in mind that this is a very fleshy plant and in wintertime, when temperatures are lower, this plant is not going to be needing a whole lot of water. Better that the substrate it remains quite dry and you only water if the plant starts looking a little bit, just starting to get a little bit limp, rather than keeping the soil moist all the time, which really is a recipe for root rot. So this is a monocarpic plant and usually when you buy it, it will have a pineapple already on it. So it's already at the later stages of its existence as a plant because it's flowered and fruited and the next stage is for offsets to turn up and for that main plant to die. A side note about pineapples as a fruit, it's actually a type of fruit called a cirrhosis, which is basically multiple fruits in one that are kind of fleshy. And that basically means it's a composite fruit. It's more than one fruit all kind of like jammed together to make uh, a single fruit. And if you cut up a pineapple, you'll kind of see what I mean by that, because you can see the, the structure inside is is in sections and that's the individual fruits. Oh, one other thing to say about pineapple fruits, there's only one per plant. So it's not like you're going to see a plant that's got a dozen pineapples on a single plant. It's one fruit per plant or, as I've already said, one composite fruit. And if you're looking to buy a pineapple plant here in the UK, the price seems to vary. But you're looking at somewhere around the 15 to 40 pound mark, I would say, depending on the size of plant you get. It's also worth pointing out that I've seen on a lot of the sales of the pineapple plants available in certainly in the UK, they often say don't eat the fruit of the pineapple that you've bought. So I guess that's possibly because they're just not being these ones are not being bred specifically for eating. They're being bred as a decorative thing. So so um yeah that I guess they probably just are not that tasty. Um so best probably to follow that advice if you do have one of these houseplant pineapples and don't eat the fruit. So yes, you buy the pineapple, it's already got a fruit on it. That means that the plant is already moving its way towards death. I mean without wishing to get too morbid, aren't we all? But, you know, it's going to come a bit sooner for the pineapple because it is naturally programmed in its genes to die after flowering and fruiting. So uh, you've got to look for those offshoots, Emma, and that will keep the plant going. But in the meantime, the plant could last quite a long time before it actually dies back completely. So I would ease back on the watering, make sure it's in good light it can take an awful lot of light and won't want to be stuck in a dark corner. These plants have quite minor root systems. I think that's probably due to its genetic heritage, probably way back in history. It was an epiphytic plant at one time, but it's become terrestrial. So but the root system is not that big and strong uh, and or deep. So that's another reason to be really careful with the watering because those roots would be quite easy to rot. There's not that much of them. Now, if you're wondering if there are varieties of pineapple out there, indeed there are. As I said, breeding has been going on for millennia uh, of this particular fruit. So you will find that there are various varieties on sale. Probably the best known is the red pineapple, which used to be a separate species, Bracteatus, but now Bracteatus is considered a, a variety of Camosus. Don't you just love those taxonomists? Anyway, it's a red pineapple, as the name suggests. It's smaller. I think it probably is still edible, but again, wouldn't recommend that you eat your pineapples from a bought plant. And you'll find there's a few different cultivars of camosas out there as well. There's one called Corona, one called Amigo. I don't think there's that much difference between them. I might be being terribly unfair to these different varieties, but on the whole, they're fairly similar. Bracteatus, though, does come in a variegated form, which is rather attractive if you like variegation. So do look around and see if there's a pineapple to suit you. Now, if you happen to have a pineapple fruit that you bought from the supermarket sitting around at home, it is possible to grow a pineapple plant from your fruit. So yes, 
you might have remember this from your childhood if you're maybe anywhere near as old as me, cutting the top off a pineapple and growing it on as a plant. So yes, you absolutely blinking lutely can do this. The only thing I would say is, personally, I wouldn't go out uh, and buy a pineapple specifically for this reason. Why? Well, unfortunately, like so many fruits, this is grown as a monoculture, as I said. And in the areas where it's grown, it has effects on not only the local wildlife, but also the local people. It's not the most... Uh, ethically produced fruit out there. I'll put a link in the show notes to a website article about the environmental impacts of uh, pineapples in Costa Rica, which is quite shocking. So I try not to buy pineapples because, as I say, it's there's a lot of damage that's being done to the wonderful country of Costa Rica by this particular plant. That said, if you happen to have one, if you've already got one, there's absolutely no reason why you shouldn't go ahead and try to grow it on. Will you get fruit from your plant? Probably not, unless you live in a tropical or subtropical climate when you've got a good chance. But generally speaking, if they're going to be indoors, it takes it'll take at least two years to fruit and you're going to need lots of light and heat for that to happen. But it's still a fun plant and a beautiful plant. And if you can get one for free, if you already have a pineapple sitting there, why the heck not? I mean, this is a core memory for me of my childhood in the 70s and 80s, along with growing the tops of carrots on a saucer, a damp uh, saucer of water and mustard and cress on, you know, damp tissue paper. That's a core memory for me. Uh, And, um, you know, that might be something that you've never even heard of, but it's something that happened a lot in the past. What do you need to do? Well, obviously eat the flesh first and then you'll be left with the coma. Now, that's just a word for the modified leaves, the bracts, a tuft of bracts at the top of the pineapple plant. And there's different ways of doing this. Some people just cut uh, a line uh, about the top sort of half a inch, to one to two centimetres of the fruit and the top, uh, the, the bracts. And then just let that dry out for a couple of days and remove any stray flesh. The other thing you can do is just literally take that coma, grab hold of it, the bracts, and just twist. And you'll twist off the leaves and also a kind of nub at the bottom there. uh, And that's where the roots are going to come from. If you do that, you can then remove some of the lower bracts and either pop it in soil or some gritty compost to grow on I think it's probably easier starting it off in water, to be honest, and then switching to uh, a gritty compost once you've got some roots formed. It's also worth saying this works best on a pineapple that is ripe, but not overripe. How do you tell a ripe pineapple? Well, you smell its bottom. (laughs) Uh, if If you lift up a pineapple and smell the underneath, it should smell lovely and sweet. And that's a sign that it's ripe. In terms of those leafy bracts, you're looking for a nice set that are kind of not looking dead, damaged, diseased. You want something that looks nice and fresh and hopefully that will then grow on into a new plant. And as you know, if you've listened to the show since the beginning, this is also possible to do with lots of other tropical fruits like mangoes, avocados. If you have those stones lying around, you can grow those on and make houseplants for free. It's tremendously fun, but just don't expect, you know, a massive harvest unless, as I say, you're lucky enough to live in a tropical or subtropical place. Pineapples in England, you know, lots of of fascinating sociological and historical things can be can be learnt from the history of the pineapple. And if you've ever been to the Lost Gardens of Heligan in Cornwall in the UK, you might have or or seen it on the TV. I think there have been documentaries about it. Um, They had pineapple pits there, which were the status symbols of the past where You know, you could only have pineapples if you had a huge amount of money to heat a greenhouse sufficiently to have these pineapples growing. So the pineapple pits of Heligan are worth a look if you've never heard of those before. You know, in Victorian times, they did produce pineapples for the big house, the posh, fancy uh, residents of that house. And it happened in the US as well. Pineapples were prized. 
The history of pineapples is truly fascinating. There's a couple of books I'd recommend on the subject if you want to find out more. Um, there's one called Pineapple, A Global History by uh, Kaori O'Connor and also The Pineapple King of Fruits uh, by Francesca Bowman. Both, I think you're probably going to have to buy secondhand because they came out a few years ago, but I'll put links to those in the show notes. So Emma, going back to your question, I would say keep a close eye on your plant stop watering it, check the roots, just take it out of the pot and have a look and check there are still roots. Um, if there are still roots, then you should be able to just ease off on the watering and it may well die back, but you might find that you get some pups or offsets or suckers coming out of the bottom, which you can then allow to root and pot up to make a new plant. And if you have a lovely pineapple, and want to tell me about how you look after it, do drop me a line as ever. The email inbox is open and waiting for you. It's on the ledge podcast at gmail.com. And it's also the address for your questions. Well, that's all for this week's show. I will be back in two weeks time. I'm off on my travels later this week to carry out some interviews for uh, the show. And I'm going to be talking to two cactus growers and somebody who specializes in anthuriums and a houseplant shop. So it's going to be a fun trip and I'm sure you're going to love the resulting interviews. But for now, you and your plants have a great week. Bye. The music you heard in this podcast was Roll Jordan Roll by The Joy Drops, The Road We Used to Travel When We Were Kids by Komiku, and Whistle by Benjamin Banger. All tracks are licensed under Creative Commons. Visit the show notes for details. <laughs>